You are watching Finding Our Talk. Hi, and welcome to Finding Our Talk. I'm your host, Paul Chaput. Storytelling and legends have long been used by Aboriginal communities to communicate their language across the generations. Today we'll visit two Ojibwe communities in Ontario and see how they've used traditional storytelling to teach their language. According to ancient Anishinaabe legend, the Great Spirit wished for an island retreat, so he created Manitou Minising, or Island of the Spirits. Today it's known as Manitoulin Island. This is a sacred place where by tradition, the greatest leaders and warriors, medicine men and women, were buried. Located on the northeast end of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay, Manitoulin Island is home to seven communities of Anishinaabe, known as people of the three fires, the Odawa, Potawatomi, and the Ojibwe nations. For centuries before colonization, they migrated to Manitoulin shores to receive dreams and visions. The island's natural beauty was, and is, a constant source of inspiration for their art and stories. <laughs> West Bay, or Chagin, is home to the Ojibwe Cultural Foundation. It exists to preserve and revitalize native arts and culture. The foundation caters to the needs of 15 member communities. In the early days, um, to my knowledge, there was no place where our people could go to regain their uh, history and their knowledge of our culture. And uh, they were concerned that our uh, culture was being uh, lost. I think uh, this was the basis of the, uh, the founding of the OCF. The foundation houses a museum, archives, a gift shop, photography lab, and offers workshops in traditional crafts. I go up to the tree and I offer it, I give an offering of tobacco before I do uh, start cutting the, the birch down. A key concern of the foundation is to develop and promote the Ojibwe language. There are a lot of language resources out there, uh, a lot of uh, materials, a lot of curriculum. Uh, my role is to identify, do the research and identify what is available and then we can start filling in the gaps. I know there are only a handful of young people, uh, you know, the generation after me that are speaking the language. And uh, the fluent speakers are my age because our children definitely need to hear the language more and the earlier the better. Alan Corbier is one of Manitoulin's rare young native people concerned with the survival of Ojibwe as a living language. After obtaining a master's degree in environmental studies at York University, he moved back to Chagin with his family. He takes an active part in community life 
and also works on special projects at the Ojibwe Cultural Foundation. I had always had an interest in learning language because I heard it as a child growing up, but uh, I wasn't spoken to in our language. Although I was, I spent an hour or so a week learning it in school. So I realized at that point, uh, when my daughter was born, that day, that our language stopped with me. That from all these previous generations, our grandmothers and grandfathers, they all spoke our Ojibwe language, our Anishinaabe language. My quest, I guess, started then, as I started to think that I can see my grandchildren and they won't be able to speak unless I do something about it. Me and the wife spoke to each other in uh, our language, Ojibwe language. Eh? And to the kids, we spoke to them in English. Because if you're in a big city like that, you, when you go out, you got to learn how to speak English, eh? communicate with people, talk to them. See? You have to learn that. At that time, I was living in Toronto as well, so I was, I guess, in one sense, uh, a real sense, there was a, a disconnection between my parents, myself, and I guess the language. And being able to learn it on a daily basis was more of a challenge being located in the city. However, there were language uh, classes being offered at the Native Center, and I enrolled in those. Most of it, uh, he learned himself. He, at the time, he was in the university, and he decided to learn the Ojibwe language. And he bought books, tapes, or sometimes in the evening he'd phone, he'd phone me, and he got stuck on uh, certain words. Alan and his father Ted work as a team to transcribe stories in Ojibwe from taped interviews with elders. The natural means of learning, of course, is when a parent or a grandparent or primary guardian speaks to the child in everyday discourse and talks to them. And that's how they, they just naturally pick up that language. And it isn't studied. And it isn't, uh, um, I guess, consciously passed on. But this artificial means of learning the language is learning it through books learning it through tapes, learning it in classrooms, and uh, as well as kind of scripted uh, interactions with speakers. When I go to see a speaker, I'll already be trying to guide the, the, the conversation. I will ask them in Ojibwe, how's the weather? Or did you see so-and-so last night? Did they, you know, then I have the next questions already formulated in my head in Ojibwe of how I'm going to answer these questions. So it's almost like I've scripted my dialogue with this person beforehand. Hmm. <laughs> Talented Manitoulin artists like Blair de Basaji also draw on their Ojibwe heritage. Growing up on the reserve, we picked up a lot of um, pre-verbal powerlessness. Feelings weren't validated to you as a child. Mm -hmm. to, I guess to fit in, I had to understand the language and learn to speak it. When I started to understand what the words meant, it started to show up in my art also. There's a lot of color and, and a lot of um, happiness in, in the language. Uh, you could say one word and then, um, it could mean five different things and it's how the person, um, body language, um, says it, and, um, and you pick up on that, and, and then it, um, it seems to maybe go onto the canvas. That's a shaman transforming into a thunderbird.
To help make connections between the natural environment and the Ojibwe language, Alan Corbier relies on Manitoulin's human resources. He and his father pay a visit to Sam Osawamek, an elder who's made a major contribution to the preservation of Ojibwe philosophy, history, and legend. He doesn't call himself a medicine man, but other people would refer to him as one. A uh, very knowledgeable person and as well storyteller and uh, a carrier of our language and uh, our Ansopkana, our stories. When I went and seen Sam, I had showed him the books by Basil Johnson that I had, and I had showed him the stories that appeared were written in English by Basil and as told by Sam Zalmik. But I wanted to hear the Ojibwe version. That's what I was telling him. One of the things about these stories and the, the elders telling them, and you were talking about this, that when I was mentioning the blurring between, uh, I guess, what would be called secular stories and sacred stories, sometimes the accomplishments of uh, ancestors approach the realm of becoming sacred. Several hundred kilometers south of Manitoulin, an urban Ojibwe community in Orillia, Ontario, also struggles to revive its language. Two years ago at the Barry Friendship Center, they had a program there, a two-day program on um, the parent-child mother goose program. And it was on um, moms and babies uh, getting bonded. Uh, I left that two-day seminar feeling that it could be done in Ojibwe and that ain't one of the things that um, uh, I learned as a, as a young child and that ain't. The family unit is very important and we don't have that now. So this is what I wanted to get back was doing the language in Ojibwe and getting the moms, babies, um, even pregnant moms when they're pregnant carrying in that, eh? They can drum and sing and do nursery rhymes with babies. a group of women, which are the Aurelia Native Women's Group, that really wanted to keep the children's programs here. They have a community action program for children and a prenatal program, and they really fought to keep these programs for Aurelia. That was, was leased a house and a uh, beautiful old home, and um, it's been going ever since strongly. Aurelia is a peaceful city in Ontario located on the shores of Lake Simcoe and Kuchicheng across from the Chippewa Reserve of Rama. An important chapter of First Nations history occurred in this area at the turn of the 18th century. Ancestral Huron territory was surrendered to the government of Canada, which then granted lots to soldiers and loyalist descendants. In recent years, with the opening of a casino in Rama, many native people came to work and settle in neighboring Aurelia. They constitute an active off-reserve community of a thousand, most of whom are Ojibwe. 
A group of native women initiated an original language project for preschoolers called Nukmis Mishumis, the Ojibwe terms for grandmother and grandfather. Grandma has their things for, um, for on-reserve people and that, eh? There's nothing in Aurelia for off-reserve. And since the casino came to Majigating, a lot of natives, Aboriginal people, have moved here, eh? And some of them are far away from home. And then a lot of them are looking for Aboriginal gatherings in that, eh? And especially the moms and the babies and that. They, they want to come together in that, eh? such a fast-paced life that, that children are sent off to the nursery school or, or during school time they're sent to school and, and there's no family bonding anymore. It's come home, throw something quick and yeah. easy on the table, eat, and then it's bedtime. So so this is going to bond them. This is going to bring them all back together yeah. and, and teach them the language. <laughs> Most adult participants in Nukmis Mishumis are not fluent speakers. Once a week, the group gets together to brush up on their Ojibwe with language teacher Lorraine McCray. So I've just recently started to uh, teach, and I'm teaching the women uh, and the children at the uh, Aurelia Native Women's Center, and I'm really enjoying it. It's a lot of fun, and we have a good time. So I'm hoping that what the women learn, that they'll be able to teach other children. It's the women all through life, all through generations that have started things. The agenda is Friday uh, for the 24th at uh, 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock at the Rio Native Women's Group. And we got the open prayer and smudge. Yeah, we were going to give Duncan tobacco and ask him if he'll do the prayer. And then I was going to be doing the smudge. Smudge, After class, the women plan the next day's special activity. An elder has been invited to tell Ojibwe stories to the children and their moms. So he said to the animals, one of us should dive to the bottom and see if we can find earth and bring it up. And he said, I'll go first. So Nanabush dove under the water. He was gone for a long, long time. And all the animals were starting to think that he had drowned it. So the turtle came and he offered his shell. So he put the little bit of earth on the turtle's shell. And the wind came from the four directions and dried this land and the land grew and grew on the tur turtle's back until it became the land as we know it today, North America. And that's why we call it uh, uh, Turtle Island. It was all taken away where we had to learn the English way of life. And when I see my grandkids now, uh, even my kids now, knowing that this is a part of their life that they missed out on, I would like them to have it. I have a set of grandkids that live in Rama, and they go to the uh, Rama school, and they're learning Ojibwe. My grandson that lives in town, doesn't, he doesn't know uh, Ojibwe, only the odd words I say to him in that day. Eh? So it goes way back that I want to give to give to moms, you know, moms that are hurting, because it's a healing. Turtle? She, she can. She can. Nana Bush says, thank you, turtle. Me glad. Wow. This, this is a bark of a tree. <laughs> right here, the turtle shell. And that's his home. And we got to concentrate on the children 
the children are like little sponges. Mm -hmm. They learn yes. so fast. Ah, you know? I mean, they, 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 it's evidence uh, here this afternoon. And those are going to be our carriers of the language. Those are the ones who's going to carry it forward into the next generation. Magic! Magic! You got two fish! Yeesh. You got three fish! Swear. The language is, is the key, is bringing the language back. And I, I really believe that's the key, and that's what's exciting people, is because we want to start with, with the young ones and, and raise them to, to learn the language. Um, I believe things are improving all the time, and the Native people have come a long way and are going to go a long way. And Nookmas Mishomas is just a small part of, of the future that's coming, and the Aboriginal people are going to get back their language. That's a bee. Mary, you did it. Good for you. Fantastic. Our song we start with is Michigan, Michigan, tell us if you can. Tell us the story of Turtle Island. Michigan, Michigan, tell us if you can. Tell us. Drum into our kids, drum into uh, the nation. You know, take it, take it to the world. This is what we want No Christmas Romans to be. We'd like to hear your comments on our program and any suggestions you might have for future episodes. Just drop us a line or look in on our website. Thanks for watching and join us again next week on Finding Our Talk. <laughs>